Hey guys, welcome to the Pistons Talk Podcast. You already know us. My name's Anthony. You can follow me um, wherever you guys want to follow me on social media at Pistons Talk. I'm my co-host, Lance Caparossi. Better get his followers up past a thousand. We really do. 20 away. You're, 20 away. You're, you're really close, man. But you can give him a follow on Twitter at Lance Caparossi right there on the screen. You can see it. For some reason, I can't find him on Twitter. I don't know why, but my Twitter's bugging. <laughs> Um, but we, we do have a, a really good show for you guys. Um, even though it's been really dark, seems like what three weeks the Pistons won a basketball game. But uh, we're gonna try to stay as positive as we can on this podcast. I'm gonna start with the Detroit Pistons backcourt, Lance. Um, this is the I believe third game that we've seen Kate Cunningham and Jaden Ivey play together. Felt like last game. You really saw what this backcourt could possibly do. They almost combined for 60 points against the Pacers. But uh, I'm going to hand it over to you. Like, What were some of the takeaways that you took away from that Pacers game? Well, the positives are Jaden Ivey's defense. We'll just start with that real quick. He looked pretty good against Tyrese Halliburton, like the premier point guard in the NBA. I think he leads the NBA in assists with almost 15 a game. I think he's averaging close to 28 a game. He is an incredible player, and Jaden Ivey looked good against him defensively. I believe he had had a block on him. That was nice. I think Tyrus Halliburton shot 0 for 3 maybe or something or 0 for 4, maybe 0 and 3, I don't remember, from the field when being defended by Jaden Ivey. So kudos to him, man. I did comment that he still looks a step slow defensively, but he recovers so quickly, man, and it's because of the athleticism. But back to the two in the backcourt, I don't know about you, but there were moments during that game where they kind of reminded me of James Harden and Russell Westbrook when they played for Oklahoma City Thunder. Now, in regard, I still like the comparison between those two. I'm not saying Cade Cunningham and Jaden Ivey are future MVPs of the league or Jaden Ivey's going to average a triple-double or Cade's going to reinvent how someone plays one-on-one. It's just there there are parts of their games it looks eerily similar, and you can kind of see Troy's vision with what he has for these two. It's only been three games. Hopefully, we all season, for the rest of the season, we get to see these two grow together in the backcourt, but it really was – it looked pretty promising for these two. It's just the rest of the starters, we got to get going so these two can flourish. Yeah, um, I, I, I'll get into the Ivy thing in a minute, but I remember last week I was telling you, I think Cade Cunningham is the type of player where he gets to the line 10, 10 times a game. And the last two games that he played, he went to the free throw line nine times, I believe, and 11 times. So he's yep. starting to get the whistle. And I think that should be the norm, though, like for him. For as much as he gets to the lane, as much as he likes to drive to the basket, I think 10 free throws a game for him is going to be the new normal. And I think that will help out the Pistons on the defensive end of the floor because they can actually have a set defense and not play from behind in transition. Um, so I, that was really promising to see Katie get to the line this week. With the Ivy thing, though, I love the fact that Cade Cunningham, we saw a lot of him playing off ball and Ivy bringing the ball up the court and vice versa. Yeah. Um, I know we, we talked about it this summer that they're such a versatile pairing that either of them could bring the ball up the court and play point guard or shooting guard. And I think we saw that against the Pacers game. I mean, combining for 66 points against Tyrese Halliburton and Buddy Heald, um, I thought was very impressive. Uh, Ivy's efficiency the past two games, to me, love it. I, I love seeing that. I, I know... You know, he, he was pretty efficient off the bench. He got sick. We, we understand that. And it looks like he's getting back into the groove of just being a really good scorer. Uh, the defense is improved. I, I will say that. I'm not saying Jaden Ivey's a lockdown defender. I'm not saying he's going to win defensive player of the year or anything like that. But I have seen improvement from him on the defensive end of the floor. And I think that's kind of what Monty Williams wanted to see from him. I know we're going to talk about that in a, a couple of minutes uh, about that decision. But I think that's the main message he was trying to get across is like, you know, I want to play you, but your defense is, you know, 
preventing me from playing you, but at least I'm seeing effort out there. Like last year, I really didn't see that effort that I'm seeing this year defensively. And I think he's conscious of it. And Monty Williams even, you know, gave him his, his respect in the, you know, a post game with Valley sports saying like him and Cade, like they played great for like three quarters, but they were just gassed by the fourth. Yeah. That's a thing though with Cade Cunningham, right? It seems like the conditioning's still not there. And I don't know. Maybe they just like hit the exercise bike or something, or maybe just playing too many minutes. I don't know. He only, yeah, he played thirty-eight against Indiana, and I think it was, I think it was similar against the Denver Nuggets. Though I do want to see him keep getting to the line, though, because I think he shoots close to eighty-eight percent, maybe a little higher now since he's gone twenty for twenty in the last two games. But yeah, around eighty-eight percent. That's an efficient way to score. Get some freebies. I still want to see him finish at the rim a little bit better, though. There was one play by him, though, that just cracks me up. It was probably like five pump fakes in a row when he was in the post. And then um, I don't know why. It just looked so funny. It just looked like someone was hitting forward and rewind, forward and rewind so many times. And I don't know why. It just cracked me up. But I would love to see him finish. It is pretty cool when they get to when they get going because we'll see – Jaden and Ivy like turn the corner and start going downhill and he'll get a pass from someone and there's just one step and he's at the rim putting all that pressure on there and then Cade's so patient with the ball when he's feeling it and then you know he's either getting to the line or hitting his mid-range jumper it's just it's so cool to see man like these guys uh, what I really love too is that they're both continuing to move even if they don't have the ball because there's a lot of times where you'll see with young perimeter players that if they don't have the ball, they just stand still. They'll either yeah. stand in the corner or stand somewhere. They take themselves out of the play. Neither of these guys do it, and that's great to see. Hopefully we just, again, continue to see improvements from these two. But holy crap, dude, just to be a little negative to start the podcast, that fourth quarter by both of them was abysmal when it came to turning the ball over. Yeah. And, God, I cannot wait for Monte Morris if he ever returns this season I mean I don't know what we got to do what kind of sacrifice we have to make to the basketball gods to get him back but we need a sure handle a sure-handed ball handler out there that's not going to turn the ball over that's going to get the guys going continue to keep, to keep them going offensively we need that and that's what Monte Morris brings and that was evident in the fourth quarter against the Indiana Pacers because that was a game that was winnable up until, like, what, the last eight minutes when they went on, I don't know, it seemed like, what, a 20-something, 20-something to nothing scoring streak or 19 to 1, I think. Yeah, that that fourth quarter um, was really bad. I want to say that. But what I will say, what's probably not going to happen, is the reason why you traded for a guy like Monte Morris, and we're going to get into the whole injury thing, whether – He's injured or not. I don't know. I'm not a doctor. I'm I'm not you know, with the team. Like, like I said, I'm just a fan doing a podcast. Yep. Uh, but I do have opinions about it. Um, you're not going to see Kate Cunningham play close to 40 minutes a night. That's why you have a backup point guard. That's why you could split minutes with the vet. And, you know, maybe you're, you're playing Cade instead of, you know, 38 to 40 minutes. You're playing him 32 to 34 and Cade can get some rest. And then you bring him in down the stretch, maybe the last four or five minutes of the game to close the game out. I think right now, Monty Williams is so reliant on Cade that when it comes to the fourth quarter, the guy is just completely gassed. And I don't even think it's a conditioning thing. I think a lot of players would have a very difficult time uh, leading their team in shots and just playing close to 40 minutes a night uh, because that is a lot to ask out of a guy that just missed whole ass. the whole season last year due to injury. I'm not making excuses for him, but um, if you watch the games, Cade looks good, maybe for, you know, a half, and then he just looks exhausted. But I, I will say with these two, uh, the spacing looks a lot better out there with Jade and Ivy. Cade looks like a more confident player playing with a guy that can actually score um, if you run him off the three-point line. And I, I, I'm just going to leave it at that. Um, that fourth quarter was bad, but... I think there are brighter days ahead with this team getting a little bit more healthier. Yeah, because Kate only had four turnovers, and I think he only – I believe he only had one in the first half. I could be wrong about that. I could pull it up here. But anyways, 
It was also the defense, the Pacers, where they were throwing three guys at him on some of those plays when he was bringing the ball up, just trying to blitz him. And good enough for him to keep the dribble alive and get it you know, out to another player on his team. That was cool of Gate heads up play, but man, they need another ball handler out there, man. They need someone that can secure it, and that's what Monty Morris brings you. So let me ask you this. We've seen Jaden Ivey for three straight games. The decision, Monty's decision to bring him off the ball, to bring him off the bench, it was very confusing for a lot of us watching early on. So do you think it was a dumb decision by Monte Will- Monty Williams to bring him off the bench? Or smart by Monty to show Ivy tough love? I think it was more of a tough love situation. I don't really think it was done by Monty Williams because at the time, you know, when we weren't on this losing streak, the Pistons were 2 and 1 with Killian Hayes in the starting lineup. And obviously, you know, things happened. Uh, like the Trailblazers game happened. Um, just like simple mistakes that I thought were fixable. But the Pistons have lost games in very creative ways <laughs> over the past two weeks. Seems like every other game, it, it's something else. And it's it it leads back to turnovers. But to answer your question, I think it was the right decision by Monty. But I wish he would have inserted Jaden Ivey back into the starting lineup a little sooner rather than a 10-game losing streak uh, on the line. I mean, if they don't beat the Wizards, I think they're going to tie a franchise record for the most losses. And, I mean... You don't want that on your coaching resume. You really don't. But um, I can understand why he didn't start Jaden Ivey to start the season um, because he's a defensive coach and he really values the defensive uh, end of the ball. And I think that's why he really uh, rode out with Killian. But even, you know, Monty says, you know what, like, you know, Killian's a a, a good perimeter defender, but I need some offense next to Kate Cunningham. I'm going to exhaust this kid. He's going to get injured again if I don't do something. Um, So... You know, I guess better late than never. I know we talked about it a little bit last week, but I'm not really mad at the decision, but I I just wish he would have made a starting lineup change a little bit sooner. That's just my personal opinion. Yeah, I've been going back and forth on it because you do see a different player in Jade and Ivy than we saw even in Summer League. Because you remember we were ta- – you remember at least I was talking about during Summer League and some of those pickup games before the Rico Hines where it looked like he was trying to play hero ball, trying to force things looking off players. And again, it's pickup. You're going to want to work on stuff like that. But Jaden Ivey, he looks like a completely different player. So I do think it was dumb to sit him for as long as you did because there were a few of those games where the effort defensively and the efficiency on offense, we saw it pretty early on in the season. We were like, okay, he looks a little different as a player. But I do agree with you that it was – it was a good idea to show him tough love because he's a very talented player, has a ton of potential. He looks real promising next to Cade Cunningham. I think they're going to be fine. It's going to take a while to figure this whole thing out. You know, I mean, like, man, dude, it's just it's terrible right now in Detroit. But I do think it was tough love with Jaden Ivey, and I, I think he's better for it, man, again, because he looks like a different player. He's more engaged, showing a lot of effort defensively he's trending upward where it looks like some of that those elite athleticism that he has can potentially be used for him to be a a pretty good defender on that side again maybe not all defensive team or anything like that but above average that's something you could see from Jaden Ivey because as long as he's sharing the floor with Cade Cunningham he's gonna have some less responsibilities as like playmaker and everything like that on that side, he can concentrate more on this. And I think that's what Monty Williams wanted him to do. And I think it's worked out. So even though there's a part of me that says it was stupid, I can't believe it took this long. What were you thinking? You're getting paid all this money. You're you're in the NBA where if you're a coach, you're the you're the best of the best. You're the brightest of the brightest. You know, like decisions we, we as fans shouldn't be saying like, oh, dude, that was stupid. You know, and that's what we were doing with Monty Williams. But, again, also, I just think it comes down to tough love with Jaden Ivey. And it even makes me want to point it out that when we were talking about earlier in the season where it seems like he was zeroing in on Jaden Ivey, it really feels that way. Like, because it doesn't seem like other players on the team were being held accountable, you know, just like Jaden Ivey was. And I don't know. 
it's maybe it was in time will tell if it was ultimately better for Jaden Ivy. But right now, it looked like the tough love thing was a good idea. Yeah, I, I, I've told you before. I, I thought the reason why he was so tough on Jaden Ivy is because there's so much potential there with him as a player. And I think he just wanted better for him to be a better basketball player at the end of the day because we all know the guy can score the basketball at a high level. We all know that. Um, but if he can lock in a defensive end, not saying he needs to be like a defensive player of the year type of player, but if he can be an above average defender, you know, a passable defender, this team will win a lot more games with him and Kate Cunningham in the backcourt, in my my opinion. Yeah. It it looks good, man. For it the, the future looks promising, even though it looks so bleak right now as a Pistons fan. But as long as these as long as Kate and Jade and Ivy are engaged. It will be, it'll be fun, man. It really will. The Pistons are number two in no. We didn't look into a crystal ball and see this year's draft lottery result. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, it seems like we're trending that way anyways. But the Athletic ranked the Pistons City Edition jerseys number two out of all the City Edition jerseys. The Pistons City Edition jerseys are a tribute to the bad boys of Chuck Daly as the only team to win back-to-back championships in the Detroit Pistons history. Quickly, we won't talk about this a ton, but what are your thoughts on the Pistons having the second best city edition jerseys? Do you agree with that decision by the Athletic? I think the city edition jerseys as a whole were pretty bad. I would say out of all of them, I maybe like two or three. And I, I like the simplicity of the Pistons city jersey. It might not be flashy, but it, it is paying homage to the bad boys. And I've told you my only complaint with the jerseys is if you're going to put, you know, crossbones on a jersey, why didn't you make them white? They're black on a black jersey. Like, I, I don't I, I don't understand that. Um, I think if they were white and you could actually see the crossbones, uh, it would be a 10 out of 10 for me. But I, I do like the city jerseys. I, I, I think they're nice. They're they're really nice in person. Um like 10 times nicer in person. I, I love the court theme, but I mean, Hey man, the, the, the city jerseys this year were, were pretty bad. Hopefully they're better next season. Um, and maybe the uh, in season tournament courts are better next season. That Pacers. Oh my God. That Pacers court. I know I'm going off topic. Holy crap, man. That was bad. It hurt my eyes. It really did. It was oh so my gosh. It was so bad. I was like, what is that? It seems like there's not enough detail on the court, right? It just seems so, I don't know, just quickly thrown together like they did it in a video game first or something. I don't know what that is. No, seriously, it does. Like They were like, ah, it's just the court. Who's really going to pay mine? That's where you focus on like 100% of the game. You see the court. It's just crazy. But back to the jerseys, what was your favorite one? And who was ranked number one by the Athletic? Was it the Utah Jazz? You know what? I don't even know. I, I subscribe for the to the athletic, but I barely read the articles. <laughs> like it's just like two bucks a month. It's out of my bank account, but like I don't know. Anthony has money to blow, is what he's telling us. Damn. Yeah, a whole, a whole two dollars. <laughs> I almost unsubscribed the other day because some of the, the articles are pretty damn bad, but overall they're pretty good. Um, I'd have to look. I can look right now. I um, I want to know because I, I have the USA Today. Jerseys and guess where the Pistons rank on that list? I don't know, five, twelve, twelve. I mean, they're not bad jerseys. Man, I mean, if you look at the they, rest of the. Oh, go on, go on. I mean, they could be better. Um, Dude, I, I, I didn't I've, see some of the other ones though. Like U.S. State today has Milwaukee, Oklahoma City. I think that's that looks terrible. Even though it kind of looks similar to the Pistons, the Mavericks one. It's all right. Chicago Bulls, they don't even post a picture. That's how bad it is. Um, actually, they do right here. I don't know. I'm not loving that one. Memphis, I don't know. It's like it's it's Braille on their jersey or something. It's weird. I mean, cool, but I don't know. I didn't know what the lines were. For. Apparently, that's Memphis, but it's like in digital code. I don't know. The yeah, Kings I, looks yeah. all right. I don't know. Utah. Yeah, I, might be- I can't find the, the article from The Athletic at all, but – um, I don't know, man. It's, it, be it, it is what it is. <laughs> it better be Utah. That's number one. I think those are the cleanest of the city edition jerseys. Pistons though. Number two by athletic number 12 by USA today. 
I guess like the Denver Nuggets. So I think that's like an altitude marker or something like that. See, these are weird, man. I don't understand some of these jerseys, but whatever, man. That's the news on the City Edition jerseys. We have another piece of news for you guys, though. And this has to do with Monte Morris, man. The beloved Pistons point guard that has yet to play a game. He was set to return, but unfortunately suffered a setback, supposedly. What makes this news interesting is that Monte Morris tweeted out a blue cap. And if you're not familiar with what cap or the word cap means on the internet, it means someone is lying or faking. So here are my thoughts on this. This is stupid. I hope this isn't the Pistons purposely sitting him out because the season's over and they're in tank mode again. I mean, I don't know how much more wins Monte Morris gets you, but there have been a couple of games where I don't know. Maybe the Pistons could have won him if they had a more sure-handed point guard in the backcourt with Kate Cunningham or Jaden Ivey. I just hope this isn't another tanking season, and that's why Monte Morris is sitting out. Because there have been a couple of videos that have been posted on Twitter where, I don't know, he looks healthy enough to play. Yeah, I, I did want to put this on the screen for people that are watching live. So on the left-hand side, this is the Pistons injury uh, report update. And I'm just going to read you guys what the Pistons medical staff had to say about Monte Morris. This is Pistons guard Monte Morris underwent a PRP injection on Friday, November 17th, as the Pistons medical staff continues to treat and rehab his right quad strain. He'll be reevaluated in six to eight weeks. And probably 10 minutes after this came out, Monte Morris uh, did tweet cap, and then he did delete the tweet uh, probably maybe 10 minutes after because people were kind of questioning the medical staff. Um, but to, to your question, Lance, uh, about this Monte Morris stuff, um, I personally think he's good to go. I think he's well enough to play. Um, there was a, we, we did an injury report, I believe two weeks ago and he was a game time decision. Yep. Um, he, he was ready to go. And then the Pistons go in, you know, injection with the PRP injection, uh, for his shoulder, basically. Um, I know Corey, Corey Woods, who's a Pistons beat reporter had sent me some videos of Monte Morris, you know, working out and his body language just looks really bad. Looks like he doesn't want to be there, but I'm not putting words in his mouth or anything like that. Um, it's just, just the body language looks bad. He looks frustrated. He looks irritated. He looks like a guy that just wants to play basketball at the end of the day. And, I mean, like, if, if this guy's healthy and you're not playing him and you traded for him just because he's got an expiring contract, that's a really bad look on the organization. It really is. Like, if you know you needed to upgrade the backup point guard spot and you knew he was injured already, you should have traded for him because there were no injury. There was, like, literally no injury reports with him when we traded for him. I mean, he was out at Summer League, you know, watching a SAR and all those guys hoop. And all of a sudden, we're, we're getting, like, oh, in training camp, he's got back spasms. Oh, he's got a sh shoulder injury now. Oh, he's going to be out another six to eight weeks. We might see him January or February. Like, the optics look bad. Because the Pistons medical staff ha haven't really given the fans um, just updates and been transparent with these injuries. Like Boyan Bogdanovich, I know this is like completely off topic. Uh, we were told that he would be good to go by game one of the preseason. Yep. And got a calf injury and he's still out. He might return first week in December if we're lucky. He's a he's a game time decision for tomorrow's game. I don't know, man. Like just the whole transparency with the fans and this medical staff, it's just really sketchy to me. Yeah, and there are some fans that are like they don't need to be transparent with us, but I would like to know what's going on. I mean, you know, as a fan that dedicates a lot of time to watching this team and talking about this team, it would be nice to kind of get an idea of one and just really supports this team. I just want to support a winner at some point. And Monte Morris and Bojan Bogdanovic, they are two people where two players that could really help your team out. And I don't know. It's just so confusing. It just seems like the Pistons as a whole, excluding the players have given up on this, have given up on this season, man. It just, and it just sucks, man. Cause I don't even really love the 2024 NBA draft class, and this is not a team. This is not the class where I'm like, cool, we need another top five pick. And it freaking looks like it's going to happen again, man. It just, 
it just sucks. And you know what's even like just what makes this whole situation with Monte Morris just a little bit more upsetting? He goes to Instagram and then he posts on his story, miss this game called basketball so much. I'll die to be out there for the team and my city. He wants so badly to play for the Detroit Pistons. If you go back to their YouTube channel and you watch that under the hood video with Monte Morris, you can just tell how excited he was to be home and to put on that Pistons jersey and just to play for his hometown team. And we're not and we're not getting it. It just it's unfortunate. And it looks like by some of the videos I've seen, he looks like he's good to go, man. It really is now it would suck if he came out too early and there really something really was serious with him. And maybe it makes another setback, but dude, to have him out for another almost two months, stupid, dude. I don't understand it, man. And again, I'm not throwing any shade at Monte Morris. I want to make that very clear because by everything that he's tweeted out, he seems like he's ready to go, you know, and we're just not getting it, dude. And I don't get it. I, I'm so confused. Yeah. That, I, I've, I've told you before when we're not live on this podcast that I'm not questioning guys that went to medical school i'm not questioning the doctors um but since arnie kander um is no longer part of the pistons medical staff it has gone downhill severely um i've never seen so many injuries on a basketball team and i understand injuries happen it's a part of the game i get it but some of these injuries just feel like they're fake they don't feel real um in amante's case i really hope that they're not holding him out um, because they're trying to see what they can get for him in the open trade market, even though they traded for him. I, I, I just don't know. I, I feel like if he was out there and if he was healthy, maybe this team doesn't have a 12-game losing streak. Maybe, you know, they have four and five wins, and our attitude is completely different, you know? But it, the, the optics just look really bad from a fan perspective because, I mean – I got a medical report. It said, you know, Monte Morris was really close to a return and he retweeted it. He's just like, yep, I'll be back soon. And then this happens. Yep. So I, I don't know. I don't know if it was a setback. I really don't know. I'm not going to question, a, you know, a team doctor's judgment on, a, you know, a patient or a player because I'm not a doctor. Um, but it, it just looks bad from a fan perspective because you, you're not being honest and transparent. With the fans, like if there was a setback, he should have said, "Hey, you know, we had a setback. He, he's not ready to come back." But, but they don't. And even the player himself is frustrated. Like you go on his Twitter, he says, "I just want to play basketball. I want to hoop. I miss basketball. I want to play for the city." Like he seems frustrated with the whole process too. I hope. I mean, I don't know what I'll do, but if they do just trade him away with we without without us ever seeing him play in a Pistons uniform, and they. And they favor Killian Hayes over Monte Morris. Holy crap, dude. I might spiral into depression. There's not many things that would push me over the edge when it comes to sports. But, dude, Monte Morris seriously is one of my favorite players in the NBA. And if I don't get to see him play for my favorite team, I'm going to be – God, I'm going to be so sad. It's going to be a terrible day in this household. Let me just tell you. Like, nobody's going to love me in this house anymore if they just decide to trade him away and they keep Killian Hayes. I – Keep both of them. Just don't get rid of Monte Morris, man. I don't want to see – I don't want to see that. I want to see him play because I do think he can help this team. I really do. Like, he's a – he has playoff experience. He knows how to win. He doesn't turn the ball over a ton. He has the offensive game to play along, Cade or Jaden Ivor. Maybe even all three of them can play – share the floor together. I don't know, but I just don't want to see him traded. And this whole injury update is just – it's it's bullshit dude it really is and yeah. it makes me lose faith in this organization not trust but it makes me lose faith in the pistons organization just a little bit i i'm with you man i want them to be more transparent with us as fans because we spend money on tickets we spend money on a crappy sports app that <laughs> half the time i don't get it you know what i'm saying like we buy merchandise and you can't you you can't just be upfront with us and of these players man it's just it's bull man it really is yeah i mean it, it, it's it, that's been kind of my opinion like even when van gundy was here we didn't see this many injuries and 
I, I, I hate to say his name because it's like taboo around, around Pistons fans because <laughs> of the Blake Griffin trade. But I think a lot of Pistons fans are kind of looking back at those teams and they're like, how the heck did he win 44 games with less talent? How the heck did he win 32 games his first year and we're on a pace for 11 wins this season? Like, Is man. It, I didn't even know it was as high as 11. I thought it was like nine. No, we're on pace for 11 wins. <laughs> Dude, if that... Oh my god, I can't even think about that because <laughs> on paper this looks like a much better team than it did last year. But holy, I mean, we, I mean, don't play on paper, so I guess it doesn't matter. But holy crap, dude! Holy crap! Yeah, it, it, it's pretty bad. But um, you know, it's it, it's just the, to the people in the comment section. You guys pay for the app. I actually don't pay for the app anymore. I it I know this is completely off topic and we're not talking about Monte Morris anymore, but like maybe I, I could spend a few minutes on like the whole um Bally experience because I know you still pay for it, right? Well, dude, they have not I don't want to I don't want to say it out loud, but <laughs> I paid for it once last year and it still works. I don't I don't know. You know what I'm saying? Like and I don't think they've charged me anything. Like I've looked back on all my accounts and I hope that doesn't screw me, but like, I don't think I paid for it again this year and it still works. I'm getting all the games. It's crazy. Yeah. Like I paid for it. I want to say last, maybe a month or two ago and everything was good. And then they decide we want to revamp our app. We want to make it better. I'm like, okay, like you should want to make the app better because there are a lot of flaws with it. Well, they revamped the app. And I cannot get in because their app is asking me to connect to my TV provider, even though I'm subscribed to their, you know, their plus membership, which is 20 bucks a month, whatever. So I subscribe to that and it still doesn't work. I can't watch it on my phone. I can't watch it on my TV, computer, nothing. I'm like, and I'm talking to tech support and I feel like I'm talking to an AI robot. And I'm like, dude, like, what, what's going on? And I was just like, you know what? I, I'm just done. I unsubscribed. I've been using um, other sites. And you, you know what those other sites are in the comment section. I'm not going to say them on YouTube because I don't want those sites to get taken down because they're doing God's work. Um, but <laughs> honestly, man, like the, the other sites actually have better quality than uh, the, uh, the Valley Sports app. And it, it's actually kind of funny. Because you'll you'll see the commercials like um, don't broadcast this or we're gonna like sue you basically and they're broadcasting it illegally <laughs> and getting away with it. From what I I took one when I was in college, this was years ago, but I remember we were talking about media law, and they had said as long as the person is not making money on it, it's it's frowned upon, but it's not illegal for sports to be streamed that way as long as the person's not repurposing it you know and making money off of it should be good to go but like i was saying i've only paid for ballet i paid for it annually one time i made one big payment i think it was like less than 200 bucks it was like 115 for like first time buyers or whatever and i have they've never they've never charged me again and i mean i know they're bankrupt so i mean and i know the nba is buying the rights back for all their teams so i don't I don't know what's going on. I'm going to ride it till it dies. I liked the Bally Sports app last year. This year, they don't even tell you in-game stats. They're, like, telling you NFL game stats. I'm looking down. I'm like, oh, cool. Ral Calvin Redley had a catch on Sunday. It's Thursday. Why are you still showing me stats for this? This is weird. <laughs> but, they won't, but they won't show me, like, anything about any of the players on the floor. And last year, you could hit the screen on your phone if you're watching on your phone. And you could like click a player and show you all the stats for the game. I thought that was kind of a nice touch, but this year they don't have anything like that. It's kind of weird. So oh, I don't know. Still, they still have it, but it's a feature, and you have oh. to go in. You have to go in your settings and enable it. I think a lot of people complained about it, but I don't want to bash Bally too hard because they are actually inviting me to a Piston game next Saturday. Bally Sports Detroit is, which I'm really excited about. They're uh, they're giving me their suite to watch a Piston game. And I was just like, that's that's really cool. So I do want to give a shout out to Bally Sports Detroit. But Bally is a company as a whole. Um, 
Uh, I'm not surprised that they're giving they're giving the rights back to the NBA at the end of the year, and we're gonna have to wait and see who's gonna buy it. Is it gonna be Apple? Is it gonna be Amazon? Are they, you know, the owners just gonna pull uh, Matt Ishbia and just make everything free? <laughs> like I, I don't know, man. It's gonna be interesting to see who buys it back out. Before we leave this topic, though, would you pay for like an all Detroit sports? Like if it was like the Lions, the Pistons, Tigers, Red Wings, like a Detroit sports network type of thing? Kind of like what Madison Square Garden does, like yeah, that MSG. Like, I mean, I don't hate paying twenty bucks a month for it. Like, if it works, I'm I'm fine with it. Yeah, as long as but, I can get the games and get playback, I'm cool with it. Yeah, it's it's just like what what Ishbia did. It, it reminded me of the uh, the UPN days, um, where you know the the Pistons were on UPN growing up as a kid and. It's like if you didn't have cable, you could still watch the Pistons. And like I said, th- th- those were simpler times, man. <laughs> much, much, much simpler times. I forgot who broke down the nepotism in the Detroit Pistons front office, but it was shocking to hear Eric Tellum's position inside the Pistons organization. So this guy, he started with the Pistons back in 2018 and 2019 as the assistant director of player development to 2019 to 2020 then in 2020 and 2021 to 2021 to 2022 he was the director of pro scouting then he got promoted again where he is the senior director of pro scouting he's been in this position since 2022 to 2023 it is the fastest rise of anybody i think i have ever seen in when it comes to this department because i was looking up some other guys that have these that are senior directors of pro scouts for other teams. And Anthony, we're talking like decades of work to get to that position. Mm-hmm. This um, dude, I don't know how old he is, but I don't think he's that old. And he no. is, I mean, he's going to own the Pistons someday, <laughs> probably next year. Um, for people that don't know who Lance is talking about, um, in, in the front office, there's a gentleman of the name of Arntellum who is very high up. I believe he's the SVP or VP uh, of the Detroit Pistons. He's Tom Gores' right-hand man. Um, he has a younger son named Eric Tellum, and I'm going to put this on the screen for you guys to see what Lance was talking about. So Eric Tellum got hired by the Pistons as an assistant director of player development um, in 2018-19. Uh, when Troy Weaver came to town. He did get promoted to a director of pro scouting. And after a year of being a director of pro scouting, he got promoted to the senior director of pro scouting. Now, if you guys saw the Mike Valeni 97-1 rant this past week, he was talking about this saying like, how, how can, you know, the, the Pistons have Eric Tellum as a, you know, a senior level director of pro scouting when the guy hasn't done anything it's kind of nepotism and in a, in a uh of what the pistons are doing and he's got 100 right um to lance's point there are people that have to work 10 20 even 30 years to even get any type of senior level job and this guy has gotten it less than a 10 year span um this is the guy and you guys will probably remember this Davida Servitas. Davida Servitas was a guy that the Pistons drafted in the second round, and J.J. Hardy was right there. Eric Tellum says, I want the Pistons to draft Davida Servitas, and we did. And he played a, a couple of games for the Pistons, mostly in the G League, and he's still in the G League as of today. Um, this is a guy that is your senior level of director scouting. And that's a huge red flag if you're a Detroit Piston fan. It's a huge red flag because if you want, you guys want to go back, the Detroit Pistons have a 25% win percentage since they started rebuilding in 2019 20. They've won 25% of their games. They've won 82 games in a four year span. They've won a season of basketball games in four years. Now, I understand rebuilds take time. We all do. But there is a lot of nepotism in the front office like Mike Bellini was talking about this week. You have guys in the front office that have positions that they just shouldn't have. They haven't earned them. They have no experience. And 
that that's a big red flag when you are an organization that is trying to get back to your glory days. Um, we want the Pistons to be a team where we're not talking about the, the top five prospects that the Pistons could land. We want to talk about um, we're a six seed. Maybe we can upset the three seed. You know, we, we don't want to be talking about no disrespect to Alex Sar, but we don't want to be talking about Alex Sar for the next six months. We don't. We want to talk about, oh, who can we get for Boyan Boganovic at the trade deadline uh, to push us into the playoffs? It's stuff like that. But, like, I, I think it's a huge red flag that um, he got promoted the way he got promoted. I have no problems with him working his way up, but I don't really think if his last name wasn't Tellum, he would have that position. Yeah, and, I mean, unless he's showing something like, you know, like, dude, this dude is like a prodigy. He's a savant. We need to move him up. We need him in this type of position. But again, I'm just looking at some of these guys. And I mean, it's totally different, though. But like Mike Abenauer for the Pistons, mm-hmm. he was the yeah. head athletic trainer from 1975 to, in 76 to 2013 to 2014. And then he was promoted to director of team operations where he's held the position since 2014 to 2015. Dude, he had to work a long time in one position to get there. You know what I'm saying? Like, he had to go through a lot, you know? And, I mean, it's obviously it's different jobs, but th- that's just what it normally is, you know? But in five years, you're basically an intern five years ago, and now you're the senior director of pro scouting. Dude, it's just it's unbelievable. Dude, like, five years ago, this dude was filling out spreadsheets. And now he's he's the boss of people, and the people that make this organization what it is. It's just it's bad. It's so bad. Is, are there f- members of like Troy Weaver's family that are in the front office? Do you know that? Or I thought um, I saw somebody had tweeted something like that out. I believe his son was in the OKC front office, but I don't I don't think he's in the Pistons front office. Okay, okay. Um, but I mean, you can even go back. Um, and I, I'm surprised Valenti didn't talk about this. Um, and I, I'm going to say his name and I'm not going to talk about what he did off the court, but Troy Weaver hired one of his best friends, Rob Murphy. And oh. if you know that name, you know, that name, he, you know, he was, he was a former Eastern Michigan university coach. Yeah. Um, he started as I think an assistant to Troy Weaver and he, he got promoted last year to like really high up. And then all the off the court stuff happened with him and they fired him. Um, we never really replaced an assistant GM. Um, someone else probably in the front office got promoted that we don't know. So, I mean, this, the front office as a whole, I I, I think needs to be looked at. I think a lot of people right now are on the fire Monty Williams train, but I mean, it it starts with the front office and it trickles on down. Um, there are people in the front office that I just don't think are qualified to run a, a professional basketball team. Yeah, and it's in. I've, I used to say this about the Detroit Lions. Like if you want to have a winning organization, it starts with the top and then it trickles all the way down. Like, you got to have the right people in place that want to provide a winning environment for the players. And you see that now with the Detroit Lions, man. I mean, it from the top on down. And that's what it, I mean, I'm not saying Tom Gores probably doesn't want a winner, but like, he's not making winning moves where it matters. And it's, it goes beyond the court, and it's just – it's sad, dude. This was the one organization that I always had faith in growing up. Like, I always thought they did the right thing. They played the right way. They they did it all, and it, it, it's so far – it's fallen so far from what it was ever since Bill Davidson, you know, had passed away. Dude, it just kind of sucks, man. The, it Someone else named somebody – now, this is a player – and it's Buddy Bayheim oh, because yeah. of his family ties. Because Troy Weaver uh, did work at Syracuse as a scout and a coach. Um, you know, Buddy Bayheim went to Syracuse, and he's playing on the the, the G League team right now, the Motor City Cruise. Um, I didn't really have too big of a problem with Buddy Bayheim just because you know he, he didn't like actually make the roster, but he was a two way. He was hogging a two way spot last season. But I mean, I mean, you, you can go down the list of just all the people in the front office decisions we made. Yeah. It doesn't look good. It kind of reminds you of the Matt Patricia Lions in a sense where 
they were doing it the Patriot way. They were bringing in all, you know, former Patriots. And it, it kind of seems like we're doing the kind of not so much like the Patriot way or the Thunder way or stuff like that. But it, it's just you're seeing a lot of familiar faces that they know just because they're comfortable and not giving someone else a shot or a chance. And also in Buddy Beheim's defense, he did have an elite skill set coming out of college. He was a really good three-point, a really just good overall shooter, but there are other things in the NBA you have to work on to become the next Duncan Robinson. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I I don't have a problem with Buddy. He's actually been really impressive in, in the G League this year. Like he he um has really changed his game a lot where he's driving to the basket more, not relying on three-point shots, but Shouts at the Cruz for being one of the best teams in the G League. Are they still undefeated? <laughs> They're five and one. Nice. Might have to buy some tickets. Who knows? Um, let's. So Sam Vecini, this guy makes a living watching and talking about basketball, and he is a draft expert. And he is a scout. I don't know if he's a scout, but he's a draft expert. But he had a bull take, and that was the Pistons' core does not fit. Now, in my opinion, it's a young team. They need a few more games together. And just a few more pieces need to be put in the right place before you can make a take, before you can have a take like that. But Stan Vecini, he came out and said, it doesn't make sense. Basically, they should start over, right? It doesn't make sense to start Jaden Ivey and Asar alongside Gabe Cunningham. I don't know about you, Anthony, but I'll say it again. I disagree with Sam Vecini. And the only reason I'm disagreeing with him is because you have to let this play out for a few more games before you make such a bold up uh, take such a bold take i, I agree i, I want to play the video for people um watching live that don't know what we're talking about so sam Vizzini is a athletic nba scout and he's been doing it for quite a long time he's very well respected in the nba draft community and this is what he had to say about your detroit pistons and their corp I think this team has been incredibly poorly built from a core perspective. And that's always been my concern with the Pistons is just fit. I mean, you look at the teams that are having success around the league right now. The rosters make sense. They fit together for the most part, right? Mm -hmm. Denver is a testament to how having a roster that fits together around your superstar is how you actualize that player. Oklahoma City, I think, is a prime example of this. They take guys... As I've talked about on this show for years now, great positional size, elite level processing of the game, and high level skill. That that's their equation. So I know me and you have talked before about fit, best player available, but I think what a lot of people took out of this video was Sam Vicini hating on the Pistons wasn't hating on the Pistons whatsoever. Yeah. I think he was just questioning when you have a starting five, because you're only really missing maybe one more piece of a core to build around. I think Isaiah Stewart is the Pistons' best three-point shooter, but I question if he's going to be a long-term starter, and I'll leave it at that. But when you have a Sar Thompson that's not a perimeter threat yet, when you have a Jalen Duran that is still developing, um, he does have some touch, you know, around like 10 feet or less, uh, but he, he's not able to, you know, stretch the defense out and hit a three-pointer yet. Maybe there's something there. Maybe there isn't. I think that's what Sam Vecini was trying to say. It's like, you're going to be really relying on Cade Cunningham and Jaden Ivey to, you know, hit three pointers in a league that's very offensive driven and both the star Thompson and Jalen Dern are very defensive driven. Now I disagree with them. I think it can work. I think the Pistons core can develop. They're still fairly young. A, a lot of these guys are under the age of 23. I think it can work. I, I think it was kind of just, you, you look at the Rockets, for example. You, you look at a guy like Sangoon versus Duran. Like, Sangoon can hit a three-pointer. He can distribute, pass. Uh, there's a lot to like there. And I, I think what Vicini was trying to say is, like, if you're building around Kate Cunningham, you need to build around pieces that uh, help him uh, not make his job harder. Um, and I, I still don't think the Pistons are fully committed to – 
building around one player yet. I don't really think they know who they want to build around yet because if they were very confident that Cade Cunningham was going to be the, you know, the franchise player for the, you know, the next, let's just say 10 years, uh, they would have went out and got him pieces this summer that could complement his game, not make it more difficult or players that were actually available. And they didn't do that this summer. Um, obviously I, I like the Marcus Sasser pick. I like the SR Thompson pick, but, um, to Fazzini's point, you do need to uh, sur- uh, surround Cade with guys that can spread the floor and make his life a little bit easier. Yeah, Cade Cunningham, 22. Isaiah Stewart, 22. Asar Thompson is only 20. Um, Jaden Ivey is 21. Jalen Duren just turned 20. Like, it's a young starting five. They're younger. That starting five is younger. They're, they're r- basically younger than the Villanova Wildcats this year. You know who are I think almost twenty three years old as a whole. It's just it's a young, inexperienced team. But dude, th- this is what happens when you always go best player available, man. Like, and it always wasn't that case. Like I know you you made a trade to bring in Turn and everything like that. But like, I just remember getting into arguments with people where it's like, dude, yeah, he th- th- this guy player A might be the most talented player, but. Player B fits with what you're trying to do. And if you're trying to build around Cade or whoever, like that's kind of the direction you have to go in. And th- I, I think I said this on a podcast one time too, like always going best player available can ultimately cost you because if nobody's in the position to succeed, they're not living up to their potential, they're going to be harder to trade or you're not going to get the right value for them. And that might be potentially what we run into with this Pistons team. But again, I still want to give it time. I want to see these players gel. I want to see them grow. I, that's what I want to see from these guys, man. And I don't think it's fair to compare them to the Orlando magic or the Oklahoma city thunder, you know, because also those teams, they've had some good draft lottery luck, you know, landed in the position that they landed it in their drafts. The Pistons, like we saw last year, they were, They dropped as low as they could possibly drop, even though they had the best odds to getting the number one overall pick. And I'm not saying they deserved Victor Wembenyama, but it's just like some teams, they have a little bit more luck when it comes to the lottery and the Pistons didn't. But also when you're in the position to draft that way, you have to, you have to find success. And that's something the Pistons, they always don't find. But again, I'm going to disagree with Sancini just because I don't know what, like, I don't even think, have Cade and Jaden Ivy, they, they've played, I think, 20, a little over 20 games together now as teammates. So, like 15. 15 oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, they haven't played a lot. Because they played 12 together last year, right? Uh, are you saying, like, played together or, like, starting? Just 12 together. I mean, just together, yeah. Oh, together, yeah. I mean, like, they've played 20. Like, if, yeah. if you're talking about, like, starting, like, 15, but. Yeah, it's only been 15. Yeah, it's just – it's not enough time, man. You just got to – we, we got to see this thing through, man, for as bad as that is. Um, yeah, I mean, to your point with the Magic, because I, I know a lot of Pistons fans, that they're looking at other rebuilding teams, and they're like, okay, why are we in the position that we're in? And I know we have talked about this probably the last two weeks, why the Detroit Pistons are in the position they're in with rebuilding. And this was a problem – long before Troy Weaver took the job. This was a team under Stan Van Gundy that made a panic move. They go out and get their star in Blake. Blake has a hell of a season to get them to the playoffs, and he's not the same player. Um, Forced himself to be out there. He missed a bulk of um, Dwayne Casey's, I believe, second season it was because of that knee issue and eventually got bought out. And he had, he wasn't really the same player after that. The reason why the Pistons aren't in the same level of competition is when you look at the rebuild as a whole, they got nothing for Blake Griffin. They got peanuts for Andre Drummond. They got peanuts for Derrick Rose, um, which they probably could have got a little bit more for Derrick Rose, but that that's a different topic for a different day. Um, Versus Orlando, you had a Nikola Vucevic who had value. They got you an extra first from the Chicago Bulls, which allowed them to draft one of the Wagner brothers. Um, They also got to trade Aaron Gordon. 
that got them some assets back. Um, and Orlando has been a team that has drafted a lot of guards, but they're making it work. They have injuries right now, but they're still one of the best teams in the East. And they have a young, innovative coach that can relate to these players because he's in a similar age group as these these kids. And Orlando plays some really good basketball. They have Vesa on their team. They have Joe Ingles. They have a Gary Harris that's from Michigan State. Like, they, they have good pieces on the team. And when you watch them play, you're like, you know, I want the Pistons to be like that. And I, I think why Orlando has such a good young roster right now is they have pieces that complement Paulo Bancaro. They have pieces to surround him to be successful. They have a coach that, you know, draws up plays for him to be the best version of himself. Like, I, I think, you know, Jalen Suggs, even though he was a very high lottery pick, you know he, he's a he's a bench player at the end of the day, but um, he gives them good, he gives them good minutes. I mean they have Markel Fultz, they have Cole Anthony. Um, you know they they signed Joe Ingles, they got clowned for it, but Joe Ingles is you know he's doing some great stuff for them right now as a vet on this team. And I think if you're a Piston fan looking at that, saying why can't that be us? Uh, it's a couple of things. It's your vets that you traded for and you know paid. They can't stay healthy. Um, you have a team that's incredibly young that just fired Dwayne Casey, which a lot of these guys that, that got drafted in 2020 were under Dwayne Casey for three years. Now they have to learn a whole new system under Monty Williams. Have to learn this point five offense that I think for them is still very complicated because they're still passing up shots. Um, a, a team that is incredibly young. The future is bright. Don't get me wrong, but it's going to be a learning process. And I know fans don't want to hear that. They're frustrated. It's been four years. I'm with you on that, but you, you have to add context to the other teams. Like OKC has like what 50 draft picks. Yeah, they, got so many. They, had, they had stars that they got the, they got to trade to you know fast track their rebuild. Um, I'm not even going to count Indiana as a rebuilding team because they didn't even rebuild; they retooled. All they really did is trade Demontis Sabonis, and they got Tyrese Halliburton back. They traded a star for a star, and they still have a lot of their. They still have Miles Turner, who was a core piece that they've had for a long time. And, you know, they, they got Buddy Heal. They got Tyrese Halliburton. And, you know, they, they hired one of the best offensive minds in Rick Carlisle and a, a really good NBA coach. Um, I think the Pistons will get there. It's just we have to wait to see what this team is before, like, really getting our pitchforks out. See how Kate Cunningham and Jaden Ivey gel together. Um See what a Boyan Bogdanovich does in the starting lineup, seeing if he's a guy that we want to keep around or maybe we can flip at the deadline, maybe to get more young pieces around this team. Um, maybe there's a position that we need to fill. Maybe it's more small forward depth. Maybe it's a veteran center. Um, there's a lot of questions that Pistons fans have, and I don't have the answers to them. I'm not going to act like I do have the answers, but I understand the frustration. I understand the frustration of being in four years and it seems like we've got like 20 wins. We're, we're celebrating for a 25 win season and that's not healthy. It's not. I, I see a lot of fans on social media where, you know, they're like borderline depressed. <laughs> like, dude, like, why do I watch this team? Like, why do I give my time and energy to a team that yeah. is rebuilding so slowly? But I, I think that's why the Pistons are in the position that they're in. Uh, if you want to add anything to what I just said, I know I rambled for like five minutes straight, but if you want to add anything to it, go ahead. No, I was going to say something that uh, those other teams did that the Pistons haven't done is they didn't hold on to aging talent. You know, when they saw like for Orlando, they saw that it wasn't working with Vucevic. They got him out. They saw it wasn't working with Aaron Gordon. They got him out. Um Oklahoma city. They were like, yeah, Russell Westbrook. We appreciate it. All you've done for this team, but we no longer can build around you. We've seen that it does not work with you as the main guy, just like it has at every stop where they thought he could be the main guy. It does not work. And the Pistons, you know, you just mentioned Boyan's name. Last year was the time to trade him. You know, like when teams were willing to offer you a first-round pick, you should have taken it. I mean, I know I was on this podcast saying like, ah, well, his game's going to age. This team's going to be better next year. He could really help. That was stupid. You should have got rid of him. You. You should have traded him. You should have traded him for Alec. You should have traded Alec Burks as well. 
That's what you need to do. And I don't know. I'm looking at some of these Pistons players, and I'm just like, dude, some of the wrong guys might be here for a long time because the Pistons believe in loyalty instead of saying, hey, dude, this is a business. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, you traded Sadiq Bay for nothing when the time was if you were if you were gonna get rid of him, you should have got rid of him after he had his 50 point game going into the offseason. You know what I'm saying? That would have been the moment to trade him. I we, we all saw the writing on the wall with that, but then you get James Wiseman for him and you trade so many second round picks. It's so weird. Like just some of the decisions are just now that I'm sitting here thinking about it and looking at these other teams as I'm trying to defend the Detroit Pistons and everything they've done, it's Dude, it's stupid. Like, it's just, it's dumb. You know, they took a franchise that we both love and enjoyed watching for many, many times. I mean, damn, dude, I've been watching the Pistons since I was 11 years old. I'm 33 now. I've dedicated 23 years of my life to watching the Detroit Pistons. And, dude, I've sat through some bad seasons. Yeah, I got to see one championship, and that was really cool. Still get goosebumps thinking about it, but. I want more. You know, I want a winning team. I want to see that. I don't want to see them hold on to players and not get anything for them and trade them at the wrong time. If you're going to make these decisions, make them and be firm. You know, make them and be firm in your decisions and seriously build a winner. Just do that. I mean, yeah, it's hard and it's so much easier said than it's so much harder than just me saying, yeah, build a winner. Because there's a lot of factors that play into it. But seriously, start putting the pieces in place to do this. It's just becoming a joke. But what players would you surround this core core group of guys for the Detroit? It's like, what's the archetype you're looking for to improve this team? I'm looking for three and D players. Um, I, I look at. I'm not comparing the two, but I look at a player like Luka Doncic, and I look at a player like Cade Cunningham because they were they were t- basically telling Cade, "We want you to play a Luka type role in you know Team USA scrimmages." You need players like that. You need like three and D wings to surround Cade with, because I think what a lot of Pistons fans do. I'm not saying all, but Cade Cunningham cannot be a guy that shoots thirty times a night. He needs a Batman. He needs a Robin to his Batman. He, he needs someone that he can rely on. Um, that's why I was calling for... I know Kelly Oubre is not like a lockdown defender, but that's why I was calling for a Kelly Oubre, uh, a Tory Craig, um, Grant Williams. I know a lot of people were on the Grant Williams trade. Like Dallas got him for a, a budget. Uh, some some Pistons fans were talking about Max Struess, who had an all-time poster against the Pistons <laughs> a couple of weeks ago. Like... Uh, I think this free agency, I know there were names out there that not a lot of Pistons fans wanted outside of Kyle Kuzma or Cameron Johnson, but there were like mid-tier guys. As I, I kind of talked about it this last uh, last week that our free agency period under Troy Weaver has kind of been underwhelming in a sense where we don't really make a whole lot of moves. I was looking back to see the last free agent we signed, and it was Kevin Knox uh, the first time around. And we signed him for $5 million. Um, and you can kind of just like go on, you know, basketball reference and just kind of see, you know, the, the failed projects like the Jahil Okafors, the Josh Jacksons, like all of that. Like I'm okay with taking a flyer on a guy, but I think you invested way too much capital into the 2020 draft, which I think is, if you look at the 2020 draft, there's maybe – you could say LaMelo, Tyrese, and Anthony Edwards are the best players out of that draft. And we have James Wiseman. We had Sadiq Bey, Killian Hayes, Isaiah Stewart. Um, I think they're all fine, but those are the three stars out of that draft that, you know, people look at and like, yeah, those are star players. I think the 2020 draft as a whole, there was a lot of role players and there were three stars. Um I, I just don't agree with it, man. Like, I, I know Ryan said it perfectly. He said, you know, we traded Luke Kennard for Sadiq Bay, and that turned into James Wiseman, which is wild to think about. But, Dude, I mean, but then you promised a guy like Desmond Bain in the 2020 class. Dude, you had Tyrese Maxey sitting in the 2020 class. You have Cole Anthony. I mean, I love Cole Anthony. He's a pretty solid off-the-bench piece for Orlando. I mean – 
Dude, he's he damn near won the dunk contest in Timberlands. It was crazy. Devin Vassell, dude, he's right there. Yeah, he's hurt a little bit, but damn, he's a good player. You know, there's just there's a handful of guys in that 2020 class where you're like, dude, you had three first round picks and you're keeping Killian Hayes and Isaiah Stewart. And yeah, there was a moment in time where we all talked about Isaiah Stewart. Maybe he probably goes in the top 10, like after his rookie year. He looked pretty damn impressive after his rookie year. But we're all wearing rose colored glasses when that happened. It, there's just too many misses to count for, you know? And I just. I don't know, man. I don't get it. Dude, there were other free agents in last year's class, like a Harrison Barnes. You know, he would have been a decent four with this team, can spread the floor, knows how to win. He's a veteran presence. That's what I want to see from these next guys. I want to see shooters. I want to see veterans that have playoff experience. And I want to see guys that are professionals that solely focus on basketball when it comes to it all. I mean, I know – probably 90% of NBA players focus on basketball, but there's a lot of guys that have other things going on in the off season that you always hear about. I just want guys that basketball is their main thing. That's what I want to see in Detroit. That is what's going to make this team better. Those are my, that's it. I want to see guys that are six, seven to six ten with a little bit of perimeter skill that can put the ball on the ground and get to the hoop or shoot a three. It's that simple. That is what I want to see. I'm so tired of taking reclamation projects. It, it just, it sucks, dude. It's just, it's so boring, and it, it's now working here in Detroit. But let's just talk about the draft for a second. We're not going to talk about players, but heading in to this year's draft, what do you want to see the Pistons do? Draft for fit or for best player available? What do you want to see from them? And what do you want? I'm not even there mentally yet. Um, Dude, give me fit. Give me fit all day. Give me fit. Uh, well, we're picking it fifth. We already know that. We're picking uh, some of the top five. Let's just be well, honest. We're picking fifth. Let's let's be clear. Um, and you, this draft has a lot of guards, but there are some small forwards that are nice. Um, Justin Edwards out of Kentucky is nice, but it's just like I can't really talk myself into getting hyped up with a, a draft class to me that is like a three-player draft class. Um, like if you're lucky enough to get an Alex Saar, you should be running through a wall. But I, I don't know, man. Like I, I would probably draft for fit at this point because if you draft best player available and it doesn't fit with the players you have, then you're just kind of in the that same position. <laughs> yeah, it's – it's stupid. I don't know. I keep saying that word on this podcast today. It's been that's going to be the title of it. It's stupid. Yeah, <laughs> it's, I, I I can't even get into the draft right now, man. It's like no. it's not it's not even December yet. I haven't even thought of, like the draft is like seven seven eight months away, dude. I know, and I'm with you. Like I looked at the draft class today. The first time I've looked at the draft class was like 15 minutes before you sent me the message, and I'm just like, I just don't even care. I'm so overdoing this this early in the season, but I'm not looking at the draft class right now. I'm just wondering, dude, you, you eventually just got to bite the bullet and say, dude, we got to draft for fit. We got to draft for fit. If Kate is our guy, that is what we have to, that is what we have to do. All right. Since we're done talking about this, let's just be done talking about that. But the rebuild, the restore, whatever you want to talk about, it's still underway. What needs to happen for this to, to right the ship in the Detroit Pistons organization? Like, if you were the GM right now, what's the what are you doing? Uh, for me, I'm gonna wait, I'm waiting and I'm seeing what I have in Cade Cunningham. And if he looks like he's a top 25 player or could be a top 25 player in the NBA, I go after some much needed help in the offseason. I'm not making mm -hmm. a blockbuster trade. I'm not trading Jaden Ivey right away unless like a Devin Booker becomes available. That's the only trade I'm making. But if I am the GM of the Detroit Pistons today and I need to right the ship and I need to get things going the right way, I am just going to play the wait and see approach with Cade Cunningham. I'm trying to get as much cap space as I can heading into the offseason as well. And then I am providing him with as much help as he needs to win and to stay with the Pistons long term. Yeah, so if I was the GM, 
and I'm looking at this free agency, I'm seeing what the, the market is for my vets because I want to have as much cap space as possible because I'm throwing the bag at either to Tobias Harris or Pascal Siakam. Um, because I think either of those players would fit the Pistons. Uh, and I, cause I want to have cap flexibility and I want to have more cap than anybody else. Like if I can't get a Pascal Siakam or a Tobias Harris, cause those are the two top unrestricted free agents. You still have guys like Buddy Heald. That's going to be a free agent. Uh, I think Buddy Heald next to Kate Cunningham would be a solid piece. Uh, you also got, you know, lower tier guys like a Gary Trent Jr. Who I think would be a good piece. Uh, you know, Malik Beasley would be a good piece. Um, if you want to get more defensive, I mean, you got guys like a Gary Harris, a Robert Covington. Um, I think this is the year when you look at free agency. There are it's an older free agency class, but I think that's what the Pistons need. Yeah, they they they, they need vets around this team that show these young kids how to win. Um, I would love Pascal Siakam personally. I, I think if the Pistons could get a Pascal Siakam, you know, throw him the bag. Give Cade his rookie extension this summer. I, I really don't care. Just give it to him. Um, whatever he wants, just give it to him personally. Dude, I'm I'm going after Gordon Hayward too. You know what I mean? Mm. He has. A, uh, I am, dude. He's played 13 games, he's averaging 14, five and five. He's not shooting the best from the three point line, but a guy that can play either forward position with. I mean, I'm I'm just saying the, the I would go after a guy like I'm not throwing the bag at Gordon Hayward. But again, just a veteran. He's been in a lot of different situations. He's been the focal point. He's been the role player. He's came back from injury. He's had a lot of different arcs in the NBA. He's been an all-star. I'm I'm throwing a little money at Gordon Hayward. If I can't get it to Bias Harris or a Pascal Siakam, dude, I mean, I think Kelly Oubre is on a one-year deal too, right? Like he's on a minimum. I'm still looking at Kelly Oubre if he becomes available from the Sixers. I, I just need some more basketball players on this team. Yeah, I like I, I'm really hoping Pascal Siakam just doesn't want to be in Toronto anymore. We got his former coach and Dwayne Casey. Maybe he could set up that meeting. I, I just think if you put him at the four next to Duran, that seems really exciting. And you have a vet. And maybe you go out and get a, a, a sharpshooter like a Gary Trent Jr. that's a little bit younger than Alec Burks. Kind of take uh Marcus Sasser under his wing. Like there's a lot of vets this year, but I just don't I don't know how the Pistons are gonna attack free agency. I don't know if they're just waiting because I think we kind of talked about it last year. We thought we were gonna get like a Jeremy Grant or a Cameron Johnson and we got Joe Harris and Monte Morris, and we were completely shocked that they were not active at all. They didn't sign a single player. Um the only signing they had was I say a Stewart's rookie uh, rookie extension contract that goes into effect next season. Um so, like I said, they, they have like around $30 million right now. That's dependent on this trading deadline, whether they want to move on from Bojan, whether or not they want to move on from Alec Burks, Joe Harris, Monte Morris. Like, th There's a lot they could do because they're all on one-year deals. Um, if you want to get some assets for them and just maximize what you could possibly do in the draft to maximize what you can do in free agency – uh, they would be very smart to have a fire sale if if this team in January doesn't have more than 10 wins. Dude, I'm going after Kyle Anderson. Dude. I'm looking deep into this free agency class. I'm going after slow-mo. I'm giving him some money. <laughs> I'm giving money to Isaiah Hartenstein. I don't, I don't care. I'm throwing money at some of these guys, dude. I just uh, – dude, it's just so bad right now. Dude, I hate that I'm looking at free agency – right now but pascal siakam dude i would just talk to him and be like look dude taxes are cheaper a little bit than they are in toronto you're gonna save a little <laughs> money just playing in the united states you know what i want to pull up real quick just the the free agent list because there are people watching that don't get to see what like i'm pulling up on my computer while we're talking yeah um because i i just want to pull it up for them so they can see what like some of the players that are actually available up that we could go after just let me save this real quick and i'm going to put it on the screen um for us to look at 
I mean, Clay Thompson's there at the top. No, you shut your mouth. <laughs> what, what website do you normally use? Spot Track, right? Yeah, Spot Track. Let so anybody just... or watching us on YouTube, if you want to follow along, you could also go to SpotTrack.com. Just I always Google 2024 NBA free agency. That's usually number one on your Google search results. And Spot Track is just incredible. They even got different filters you could use. You always look for the unrestricted free agents. But Clay Thompson is number one. Tobias Harris, crazy number two, and ahead of James Harden. That's crazy itself. But they're just going by cap money, how much they cost last year. Yeah, I mean, for some reason, my computer doesn't want to work, and I don't know why. Hold hey, on. maybe maybe even Demar Derozan, maybe he comes. Maybe he just takes a three hour three hour drive. Oh, uh, it's a little yeah. Bit Six maybe hours. uh him and him and K just want to shoot like fifty freaking uh, mid range jump shots a night. You know <laughs> when Demar Derozan was in San Antonio, I forget how many assists he averaged per game, but he was near the top at generating open three-point looks for his teammates. I think he was like in the top three when he was in San Antonio, and he operates all in the mid-range, but he generated so many open threes for his teammates, and that's something he could do here in Detroit. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's possible. It's just the, the mid-range thing is just I, I like DeRozan a lot, but I don't really know if he would want to come to another rebuilding team. It, it kind of seemed like he was pretty pissed when he had to play in San Antonio. Let me, I'm almost done with this, and then I can put it on the screen. Just want to make it into a graphic so everybody can see it. But, I mean, for the most part, this free agency is pretty, fairly weak in my opinion, but... There are some vets that can't help this team. Let me just get the second one, and we'll be done. I can put it on the screen in a second. Let's see. I know I'm just... I usually never do this, but since we're talking about it, I was like, why the hell not? Why not just talk about free agency? <laughs> um, what about Spencer Dinwiddie? You'll probably... I don't even... I don't think he would never. I don't think he would step foot in Detroit ever again. And I um, liked him with a lot. Malik Monk. It's crazy that he's only twenty five, and he already has seven years of NBA experience. I mean, he's been pretty good for Sacramento. I'm not gonna lie, dude. Grayson Allen bring a little more bad boy mentality. That's the last thing we need. <laughs> we need something. Maybe we bring back Mason Plumley. Point Plumley, Plum Dog. I got no problem. With it. <laughs> oh my god! If if Troy brought back Plumley, dude, I don't even want to see Twitter. I would um, love Plumley here in Detroit again. So here's some of the free agents. I don't know if you guys can see it, but like the, the top free agent on Spot Track is Clay Thompson right now, which. I, I don't even know what's going to happen with Clay because he looks really bad <laughs> with Golden State. But you can see, you know, Tobias Harris, James Harden, no thank you. Uh, Pascal Siakam, that's kind of like my personal favorite right now to go after. And I know you were a Gordon Hayward fan. I, I don't know, man. It's I wouldn't hate Mike Conley as a backup for the Pistons. I think he, yeah, that would be pretty cool. Um, dude, I'm still looking. I'm really down. Far, I'm really far down on the list. Dario Saric, Kelly Oubre Jr. Give me some of those guys, man. Yeah, I, I mean, like this, this free agency is pretty damn bad. I'm not gonna lie. Like, <laughs> dude, I mean, a lot of these guys complete the complete the roster though in Detroit, man. You'd be able to see a whole different look just bringing in some of these names we've mentioned. It would be potentially a lot better for the Pistons if they brought a few of these guys in. Yeah. Um, I'm just answering a question real quick. So I, we didn't talk about this, but I don't know if you saw, but NBA TV took away our, one of our national televised games against yeah. the Lakers. Yeah, that was something I meant to put in the news when we were doing the production and everything. I, I had it bookmarked and everything. Dude, good. Good for the NBA. Nobody wants to watch the Pistons on a nationally televised game. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, dude, you're gonna like carve your own eyes out. Like, it's it's terrible sometimes 
I'm going to still watch them because people that watch the Pistons are sickos. Like, we might need to be evaluated mentally. I just don't understand it. Like, I don't know why we put ourselves through this every single game night. But I'm glad the NBA TV took the game off. The Pistons don't deserve it. They really don't. So it's embarrassing, man. <laughs> I don't know your thoughts on it. I don't know. I'm just I'm reading the comments. People are talking about Miles Bridges. I, I don't even know if he – is he a free agent after this year? Yeah, I saw him on the list. Yeah, I, I don't – I. <laughs> It's kind of hard to ignore like the off the court stuff. And obviously I, I don't know what, you know, went on with him and his, whatever she is. I don't know if he's, she's his girlfriend or his wife, but all I know is Troy Weaver made Josh Jackson rent a house across the street from him so he could keep an eye on him. Um, and I'll let you guys like Google Josh Jackson, the type of stuff he's going through right now. I'm, I'm, we're not going to talk about it on the podcast, but I'd find it really hard to believe this front office would take a chance on a, a local guy like that that does have some off the court stuff. I'd like him as a player, but I, I don't know if the front office would. Dude, speaking of the Charlotte Hornets, trade for PJ Washington. Now that Miles Bridges is back, they moved him to the bench, and we could use him in Detroit, dude. He's a solid four in a small ball five. Like, do whatever you got to get to P.J. Washington here in Detroit, man. That's a guy that would play here for a long time. Let's bring up this final topic, though. and It is Draymond Green talking positively about Asar Thompson. If you want, you can post that tweet. We'll read it aloud for the people watching and for the people listening that can't read. It says, Asar Thompson averaging 10 rebounds and almost two blocks per game is not being talked about enough. That's wild! Exclamation point. Let me guess, though. It's not points, so it doesn't matter. Draymond, it doesn't matter because he is third on the rookie ladder behind Victor Wenbinyama and Chad Holgren. It does not matter what Asar Thompson does this season. He will not get any love unless it is a poster dunk on Miles Turner. And it will be circulated for a couple on, you know, for like a couple of days. Now, if he gets crossed up by Tyrese Halliburton and gets dropped to the floor, that will be shown quite a bit as well. But it's cool that Draymond Green praises Asar Thompson. Unfortunately, he happened to be in the wrong rookie class to win Rookie of the Year and get all the love he actually deserves. Yeah, I mean, it. I, I like that Draymond is showing Asar love. It's I, I think it's the second time we've talked about it this past month that Draymond has just been really impressed with Asar and Amin Thompson, just them as players and stuff like that. But... I'm not really too concerned with the the Tyrese cross. I mean, stuff like that happens. It did look like he pushed off a little bit, but he did push off. He did push off. <laughs> uh, the 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 dunk on uh, Miles Turner was nice. It looks like he's just trying to catch a body every other game. He's just trying to dunk on somebody, but um, makes me think Dr- a Draymond Green homecoming could happen eventually. Oh my god, dude. <laughs> I mean, maybe the WWE match. When is the last time a mean times? He's only played four games. I feel like it's just one of those things where he's injured, dude. <laughs> yeah, I know he's. I know he's hurt. I know he's hurt. But I'm just saying he's only played four games. Like, not discrediting him, but like, what is? I don't. I didn't think you saw enough in four games for you to really like. I, I get the praise for Asar Thompson, but if Draymond Green's, a, you know, praising a mean a men Thompson is probably just like. I don't want to hurt your feelings because I'm talking about your twin brother, but I don't know. It's only been – he's been – it sucks. I'll just say – I'll end it with that. I don't want to seem like a jackass. <laughs> well, maybe he watched him in OTE. That's that's how he evaluated him. Because I don't, I don't think uh, the Warriors played the Rockets really early in the season. But, I mean, even in the summer league, the, the one game he had, he, he looked electric. But he's just had uh, injuries so far through his early career. But, I mean – Asar is a really big positive point with this team, just for his defense alone. I saw a stat the other day that him and Rudy Gobert are the only two that are, like, top 20 in blocks and offensive rebounds. And Rudy Gobert is, like, a three-time defensive player of the year. <laughs> Asar is a rookie. Like, it seems like every other week we're, we're seeing Asar break uh, not only just rookie records, but records with his rebounding and his blocks. Do you think there's, like, a slight comparison to Draymond Green and Asar Thompson? Do you think there's any similarities in their games? I think from a defensive standpoint, there is. But Draymond Green's a really good passer. He's a really good initiator on the offensive floor. Um, 
But maybe, you know, Draymond is seeing a little bit of himself in Asar. That's why he's talking about him so much. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I think Draymond Green is such a unique player. We're not going to see too many guys like him. I mean, we'll see, like, the Swiss Army Knife types. But, like, what he did for Golden State, I mean, it was the perfect situation. Let me say that. But he thrived in it as like a power forward and a small ball five and kind of like a point forward too, you could say he thrived in that system. I just think Draymond Green is one of those truly unique players that it'll be very hard to come by another guy like him. But I, I guess I do see the similarities in defense defensively with the, uh, you know, the, the ability to switch one through five, it seems like, I mean, Asar is only going to get better, but I mean, beyond that, I don't really see too much similarity. I think Asar could eventually get to like being like a 17 to almost 20 points per game score in the NBA once he figures out his shot. That little turnaround he does where he jumps like four feet off the ground and shoots it from like four feet out, it's pretty awesome. I hope he never loses that. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's pretty crazy that – I don't know. Like, I was talking to someone earlier. They're like, can you imagine Isaiah Stewart and Draymond Green on the floor together? I was like, oh, no, dude, that would be like Goon Squad. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I think Jalen Durden and Draymond Green would be kind of fun, too, you know? Yeah. We, we need shooters, though. Like, as much as I love Draymond Green, um, I don't really think he would be a solution. I like that he, he, he is talking positively about the city and talking positively about Asar Thompson. But, I mean, I think this team needs more perimeter players and they need defenders right now. Dude, and also I would love to see them put Duran in like some action where he's up high, like at the elbow, where he can initiate a few things and get Kate or Jaden Ivy coming off some screens and cutting to the hoop. I saw some I think it was Steve Jones that post those videos and how like Phoenix uses Nurkic and then like Shane Goon and Nicole Jokic. I'm not saying Dern's on that level yet, but he's shown that he can be a pretty good passer and you know, make some touch plays like that. So why not try to run something? Be a little creative offensively with these young guys if the three-point shot isn't falling. You know, just do something. I just I just want to see something else. But do uh, we have any Q&A questions? No, but I, I just saw something from uh, Hoopsite. So you know how they have, like, their, their player rankings or, like, country rankings for, like, players? Um, they just came out with their sixth man rankings, right? Yeah. And Sadiq Bay is listed 14th right now. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Just thought I, I'd, I'd, I'd put it in there. <laughs> Did you, are you concerned with Monty Williams saying that he's not concerned with 14 game losing streak? Did you see that posted by, I think, either Mike Curtis or Amari Sankofa? I think it was Mike. Yeah. Um, yeah, I saw that. Um, I'm not too concerned with it because I saw Van Gundy go through a similar thing. Like when Van Gundy first got here, his first like 28 games, he was five and 23. And really? until he waved Josh Smith, they didn't go on like some, they went on that like little run with Brandon Jennings and all those guys where they were, they won like 10 straight games. Um, I'm not, I, not worried about it, but I don't expect a coach to say, "Yeah, we suck." I'm worried. Why did I take the money? Like, <laughs> I, I'm not worried. I, I think coaches aren't just going to do that. I don't know. I'd like to see him say something else. Like, I mean, obviously his job is not in jeopardy or anything like that because he signed a ten year contract. But just to show like a little bit of panic and say, "Yeah, we're going to try to right the ship. We're going to try to end this losing streak." We're going to try something different. We're going to think outside the box. I don't know. Give me something other than you're not concerned. I know you're not losing any sleep over it because, dude, you're, you're sleeping on $100 million, man. I get it. And there's that gif with the guy crying with the money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, like I said, I don't, I don't think Monty's a bad coach. I think he's stubborn at times, and that stubbornness does cost games. But, um, He's not going to say, like, yeah, I'm worried that we're um, losing all these games. He says at every press conference, yeah, it's frustrating. Yeah, we got to stop turning the ball over. I got to do a better job at this. I got to do a better job at that. It's probably really hard 
to coach these guys in practice and to keep making the same mistake game after game after game. And you don't have a vet that you can just say, hey, go in the game, calm this game down. He doesn't have any available vets, really. Like Alec Burks, I know we didn't even talk about that in the Indiana game. Dude, he was awful. Yeah, he's terrible. Looks like Killian Hayes out there. (laughs) (laughs) Dude, he was pretty bad. He, I don't know what they did, but his shot, he just... Dude, he lost it. He lost it, bro. It is, dude. He just he sucks. Dude, he sucks right now. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like we didn't talk about that. Like I was I was rewatching the game today. I was like, bro, like is he injured? Is he hurt again? Like what is he doing? Dude, he's not getting to the free throw line. It's, it's he just seems a shell of his former self. And I mean, he did hit a couple threes late. I think in the second half. Yeah. Maybe in like the maybe not late, maybe in like the third quarter or something where it seemed like his shot was starting to drop, but like they were catch and shoot in rhythm, him stepping right into his shot. When they were asking him to put the ball on the ground and try to create for himself, it just really wasn't working. So I don't know, man. Maybe uh I don't know what you gotta do in that second unit, but if you want him to thrive, you need to put him around some guys that can create some open looks for him in you know, try to drive his defense off of him. And you don't get that with Killian Hayes at the point guard spot, man. Yeah, uh, I, I don't know. But we, we do have some Q&A questions. We'll, we'll answer a couple, and then we can wrap this podcast up. Um, We can talk about it, but we don't have the answer to it. So I don't know if you've noticed, but the defensive specialist coach that we brought in from Indiana, Dan Burke, he's been missing for over a month. Um, he's not on the front of the bench with Monty Williams and Jared Jack. He's just been gone. All I will say, all I'm going to say is this, is I hope everything is okay with him, whether he's sick, whether a family member got sick. Um, because if that's the case, that does suck. But the defense has really hurt, I believe. Uh, because when he was on the bench, the Pistons were one of the best defensive teams in the NBA. They weren't allowing, you know, 120 points a game. Uh, like what they've been averaging over the like the last five or six games. But I don't really know what happened to him. The Pistons haven't really made an announcement about it. So hopefully it's nothing serious. I don't know how you notice that. I don't know any of these coaches by them sitting on the bench. I was so surprised. Like I think it was a couple weeks ago you tweeted out, like, dude, where is this guy? And I'm like, how do you notice? What are you watching when you're watching these games? But I think – Omari Sankofa actually tweeted out before we did this podcast that he is dealing with some personal matters that have taken him from the team, but I think he's still at practice. He's just not at the games, I believe. So I don't know, just another series of unfortunate events for the Detroit Pistons, man. And whatever's going on with Dan Burke, I, I, I hope it gets well for you, man. I really do. Yeah, I really do. Like he, he was a, that's why I was really hyped with this coaching staff because, uh, you know, he was on all those great Pacers teams that were like defensive juggernauts. But, you know, I'm wishing him well. Hope he, he does come back, you know, sitting, you know, next to Jared Jack and Monty on the bench. Uh, this comes from QT. He says, Boyan starts at the four when he's healthy, stew to the bench. You're speaking my language, QT. Let me just tell you because I have been calling for that. I think Stu, Isaiah Stewart would be very good off the bench. He's an energy player. He has a lot of hustle. Um, He gives you a different look at that five spot. I still want to see Marvin Bagley out on the floor, so it becomes kind of interesting between those two. But give me Bowie on at four. I don't think it's going to hurt the rebounding that much, especially if Asar is still in the starting lineup with Jalen Duran. Those are your two rebounders. They're going to feast on the boards. That's all I care about. And, hey, it might even help Cade Cunningham get some rebounds to help my fantasy team out. But Bojan at the four, that's a must. Bring Isaiah Stewart off the bench. I've been saying it for a while now. Yeah, I've been thinking about this. Like, Bojan plays small forward, but he also played a lot of power forward last year for the Pistons. And it's like, do they put a start at the four and Bojan at the three and send Stu to the bench? Or do they send a Sar to the bench and just insert Bojan and have Stewart next to him? I don't really know the answer. I, I think you could even throw livers at the four in some situations, but it's going to be really interesting to see who loses their spot in the starting lineup because I think somebody will. 
it better not be a SAR, dude. I know Monty kind of hinted at that a couple weeks ago where he said, the only reason he's starting is because Bojan's out. And you're like, dude, he's the only guy that plays defense. And you preach defense. How could you move him to the bench? <laughs> it doesn't – it's all backwards, dude. I mean, if that's the case, if you want this team to be defensive-minded and then you push the guy that plays really good defense to the bench, how do you play for this guy? Yeah, I think to your point, uh, to, to um, QT's question, I think Stewart to the bench would make sense. But then you you kind of get in a situation where you're probably going to play a, a, a too big lineup, maybe if you want to do that, with Stewart and Bagley. But you also have Livers healthy now too. So it, it makes it all weird. Like, are you, you going to throw out like a – I'm the spitball, like a Killian Hayes, a Alec Burks, an Isaiah Livers, an Isaiah Stewart, and a Marvin Bagley as your second unit. I mean, you got three shooters around Marvin Bagley and Isaiah Stewart, Burks, and Isaiah Livers, and then you got a bunch of shooting around Killian Hayes as well. You know, and you got a roll man and Marvin Bagley who can actually catch a ball and finish at the rim. I just think Isaiah Stewart, it's there's not enough volume from the three point line for him to be a starter on this team. Like if you're shooting it, I don't know how many, how many times is he shooting it from the three point line? Let's go on stat muse. <laughs> we'll tell you. Um, dude, basketball reference. That's my go-to site, man. Dude, I like stat muse, but they do. They got greedy. It used to be good. And then it's like, they only allow you 10 searches a day now. Yeah. And then they make you pay for like, you're like, Oh, you want to see how many, you want to see his three point percentages? Pay us ten dollars, and you're like, dude, fuck you guys. I'm going to basketball reference. Um, he shoots it, dude. I'm right though. You know what I'm talking about, dude. It's they they are greedy. Yeah, he only shoots it three point six times per game, so we'll round up to four. That's not enough for a guy shooting forty one percent from the three point line. He needs to be shooting it like seven times per game for teams to take him seriously. Yeah, more shots, dude. Kind of feel bad for James Wiseman because. You know, he's been playing a little bit better recently, and it, it just seems like he's the odd man out in the rotation. Dude, I was stupid for thinking it was a battle between James Wiseman and Marvin Bagley. Marvin Bagley so much more skilled offensively than James Wiseman. I don't know who he's playing better then, but if you say so. No, I, I mean, like, in the short time that we've seen – Wiseman, I mean, he's actually trying out there. But I will say, Marvin Bagley on defense this year, his effort this year versus last year, 100% different. Oh, dude, like, He's actually blocking shots. He's actually trying out there on defense. I don't know who got under his skin, but whatever they're saying or doing, keep it up because he looks he looks great out there. I know someone said, why didn't they play Bagley down the stretch and they, they threw Stewart out there? I don't know the question to that. Dude. I really don't. I would have rather just had Bagley out there. Yes, especially in the Denver Nuggets game. Holy crap, dude, where he had, I think he had 18 and 10 with Nikola Jokic off the floor. Isaiah Stewart, I think, got blocked from behind on the final play. And I'm like, dude, if you had Marvin Bagley there, he's probably dunking that. He's so much more better down in the post. And that's no shade to Isaiah Stewart. It's just he's limited. He's limited in what he could do because he's not as athletic as Marvin Bagley. He doesn't have that explosiveness. And that's what you need from your five. Your five. And Marvin Bagley gives you that. Um. Man, dang, dude, I can't believe we're talking about this. This is crazy. But, yeah, Marvin Bagley should have been out on the floor. That last game, how many blocks did he have against Indiana? Three blocks, and they all came in within, like, what, 30 seconds of each other? It was just so awesome how it happened, too. Or maybe it was two blocks back-to-back. -back. He looked good against Indiana. It was awesome. Yeah, I mean, he he's you didn't really see, like, that defensive effort in Sacramento. Um, and I, I think if you look at the contract as a whole – that contract looks great. Um, it's so crazy that the Pistons got him for a second round pick. If you think about it, <laughs> yeah, dude, we yeah we won. And what was it, Trey Lyles too? No, we're not gonna get the Kings fans started on that, <laughs> dude. I was actually looking up Trey Lyles the other day, and I'm like, what would it take to get this guy back? We need someone that gets some shot, dude. Hey, I don't know about you. I love Trey Lyles, bro. I got a lot of love for that guy. No, yeah, I had clipped a video um, of us like last year, and we're saying we won the trade. 
And it's still getting comments to this day of Kings fans saying, who won the trade? Losers, like, every day. <laughs> Kings fans, like, I, I love I love the bitterness and the saltiness, but, hey, man, chill out. <laughs> that is hilarious. Dude, I, I wonder if I could show my face in Sacramento. Or, if like, if either of us could, or, like, what would be the response? Like, if we just touched down in Sacramento, do you think Kings fans would recognize us as the guys that said winners of the trade? Uh, I'm not sure. It's it's YouTube people. So sometimes I I realize that like faceless YouTube people don't exist. They're not real. You mean they like, just don't? They're, 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 yeah, there are like some people on here that have profile pictures and that I actually know, like personally watching the live stream right now. But there are like trolls in the chat that I know just are not real people. <laughs> we should get uh, maybe we should capitalize on that saying. We won the trade. We, should totally, <laughs> we gotta find a way to do that. Uh, oh god we'll do uh, uh some more q a questions so this is charlie he said should the pistons focus on dominating the mid-range since the three isn't there across the board dude i just think they need to be creative more offensively like if you can't get three points from the three-point line draw something up where you're getting at the rim and getting a chance at Scoring two and going to the line for one more. That's what I want to see. Just you got to get more creative getting to the line. And, you know, whether you're – I just don't know. We saw 20 free throws from Cade the last two games. He needs to keep that up. But, no, still keep shooting the three. Do that. Let Cade live from the range. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to, to Charlie's question, um, I don't really think they should focus on the mid range. I think that they pass up a lot of shots that I've seen so far this year. Like there are times where people are just wide open and they don't shoot the basketball because they're still learning the 0.5 offense. Um, I think once they get more comfortable and stop passing up shots and actually shooting higher volume of three point attempts, um, we might see games that are a little bit closer, but I really wouldn't focus on the mid range. I feel like Cade, and maybe Alec Burks are the only two mid-range scorers on this team that can you know make it at a an efficient rate. Like Ivy can do it, but I think Ivy's better just in transition and getting to the basket and shooting a, a three-pointer, you know, once in a while. But not really focusing on the mid-range. I, I probably wouldn't do that. I mean, Killian Hayes every twelve games can do it. No, I thought you were not doing. I thought we're not like doing. <laughs> we, did, we did one Killian joke today. We're not gonna make this a Killian hate podcast. Um, I was just see. My name is oh, this is a good. No, I'm not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a question uh, from Don now, who's watching on Facebook. He said, "So where does that put Sasser with minutes when Monte returns? Monte Morris returns." Um, unfortunately, probably out of the rotation. This is what I was talking about at the beginning of the season. Like, more a uh, Sasser would probably be the guy, the odd man out. And we saw so many flashes of him. I just think they honestly stick with Killian Hayes. And maybe there's somewhat of a battle between Killian Hayes and Marcus Sasser for that, I don't know, third string spot. But there's just not enough minutes to go around. And unfortunately, I just think Sasser is the odd man out when, it, when Morris returns. But it's two months from now, so, I mean, it'll be a while. Yeah, I, I think when you look at the rotation with the point guard position, obviously right now it's Cade Cunningham, Killian Hayes, Marcus Sasser, which I don't like that Marcus Sasser went from, you know, getting consistent, you know, 10 minutes a game to barely, you know, getting five minutes a game. I think Killian Hayes had 17 uh, minutes last game, and he didn't score a basket. Um, I, I'd like to see Sasser get a little bit more playing time than Killian, but I really don't know um, what happens to Sasser. There could be a, a situation where they might trade Morris at the deadline. There really could, um, because he could return by January, trading deadlines in February. Uh, maybe you can get something for him because I, I just with this injury stuff and, you know, him being frustrated with the medical staff, maybe he's not in the Pistons long term plans. Dude, he's only 28. 
I, I know, but it's just maybe Morris just wants to get out. Got it, dude. Like, think about it, though. Like, if if he's healthy and he's saying that they're bullshit, and like, why would you want to play for a team that won't clear you to play if you're you're good to play? I mean, I think sometimes just to play devil advocate a little bit here, like you could say like, man, I feel perfectly fine. They're like, well, you're not, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like I remember yeah. once I had a surgery and one doctor was like, yeah, I'm not the type of guy that really knows you, the extent of injury you went through, but you're standing here. You look good. You could probably go out and play basketball. And then that my, the, the doctor that I normally saw was like, is that guy crazy? You could not go out and play basketball right now. You're like, you're like three weeks removed from surgery. What is he talking about? Just cause you're, you're walking normal and you're standing upright doesn't mean you can go out and play. You got a lot of injuries internally that are still going on. Like that stuff has to heal first. And maybe it's something like that. I don't know, man. But it like we already talked about earlier on the podcast, it's a little fishy. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's I don't want to make assumptions that he's 100% healthy and the Pistons medical staff are, you know, just idiots, but uh, I, I don't know. It's it's a good question, Don. Now it, it's kind of sad that Sasser probably won't get much playing time if Morris does come back and play, and he's one hundred percent healthy. Um, let's see. Could the Pistons draft? I'm just looking for a good question because a lot of these questions are very depressing. This comes from Cade Season. He says, does anyone actually think we're already throwing the season away? I mean, it's – I don't want to think that way. But until, like, Bojan and Monte Morris come back, it kind of seems that way, man. Like, it really does. I don't think that was the intention of the Pistons. Maybe 28 to 32 wins was a little bold, which is kind of unfortunate. And I know the season is still early. We're, I don't even think we're still – I don't even think we're 20 games in yet. But, dude, they would have to win. There's, what, 66 games left, I think, in the season maybe. They would have to win half of those to get to 32 wins. You know, I mean, not even half. They'd have to win, yeah, 30 to 32. It just seems like with all the injuries, it seems like the season is just – there's no hope. It doesn't seem like it's going to be a good year. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're 16 games in. The, the season isn't a quarter way over yet. Um, I know uh, Basketball Reference <laughs> beta a chart today saying that the Pistons have a 0% chance of making the playoffs. That was kind of depressing. Yeah. Um, I think more people look at, you know, the 2-14 the and 14 and, like, you know, this season's a wash. Like, we're probably going to be playing for a top five lottery pick this year. We're going to be in the lottery. I think if you, it, it just depends on like how you view this season. If you thought this team was going to win 35 games and push for a play in spot, then yes, I would probably say that se- this season, you know, quote unquote, throwing the season away already. Sure. But if you're just looking at the season as, Let's see what Kate and Jade and Ivy can do. Let's see if uh, Asar can, you know, develop as, you know, the, the months and the games go on. Sure. I, I think if you look at individuals versus, like, the team success, then no. And I think that's what I've been doing lately. I've, I've been more focused on the individuals than I have the team success because I know it's a process and it's going to take time, uh, especially when a new coach comes in trying to establish, you know, all new plays, stuff like that. But. It just really depends on like what your your view is on success uh, for the Pistons this season. Personally, for me, I wanted to see them win more than seventeen games. We'll see if it happens, but I'm not sure yet. I mean, I wanted to see them win twenty eight thirty two. You've heard me say that, yeah, many times, and I hate to be a heavy downer, but man, it's that's the way Ray we're going. It sucks. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I, I'm just more focused, like right now, on the individuals. Um, no, I get that. I get that. That's fair. I mean, that's really the only way to watch them. You know, is just like we were talking about earlier on the podcast. Like, let's watch the growth of Kate and Jade and Ivy in the backcourt together. Let's see what 
Marcus Sasser can become. Um, let's see if Asar Thompson can develop a jump shot. I don't know. You know, it's just that's yeah. <laughs> Yeah, like we'd much rather be up here, you know, talking about like, oh, the Pistons are only two games out of that final playing spot. We really would, but hey, man, we'll, we'll see what happens when Boyan comes back because apparently he's going to be the Lord and Savior of this team. <laughs> <laughs> That's the Pistons fans you're telling me. They're like, apparently, we're getting Jason Tatum back. <laughs> at, one time, at one time, he was probably being looked at like Jason Tatum. Um, let's see. This is a question from Organic Linda, who seems like he tunes in every week, so shout out to him. At what point do you start to start at the four and bring Stewart off the bench? When Bojan gets healthy. <laughs> That's probably <laughs> the time. We'll see what it is when Bojan gets healthy. Or unless Monty wants to get crazy and start Isaiah Livers, Mm-hmm. In the court, which would be kind of cool to see Livers in Asar switching every. I mean, the, Asar doesn't really switch in anything, he just fights through, but that'd be kind of fun yeah. to play. Yeah, I, I think at one point, organic, I think you could see it as soon as, like, I talked about it a little while ago. Like, if you want to just throw Boyan in at the small forward position and you still want defense out there. Could have a star at the four if you want. I think he rebounds well enough to where he can battle because he's rebounding better than, you know, rookie candidates that are over seven feet tall and Chet Holmgren and Victor Wembenyama. Um, but there is the size issue too because he's only six, 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 seven. But I don't really think that that's really a, a crazy question to ask. Someone's going to lose their spot. I just don't know who it's going to be. Personally, this comes from uh, Deep Buck, and then we can wrap this podcast up because we've almost been on for two hours again. Uh, if the Pistons get a top two draft pick, should we trade it for a vet in prime looking to leave the team? That's a good question. Um, should the Pistons, if they get a top three pick, should we trade it for a vet in prime looking to leave his team? I mean, you gotta you'd have to throw me some names out there, but I, I don't know how many guys are trying to leave their teams, and a few of them are that we've talked about already that look like they're not happy with their situation. Will will be free agents this year. I could throw you one right now. Who's that? Zion Williamson. I'd do it. I'd do it for either him or Brandon Ingram. He is not playing a lot. Who? Zion. Zion. He's not – every time I look, it seems like he's out with rest. Um, he hasn't been playing back-to-backs. I have him on my fantasy team, and you kind of expect that. But I think he's – yeah, last game he played 34 minutes and had 32 points, six rebounds, five assists. Then against the Kings on November 22nd, he played 35 minutes and had 25 points, five rebounds, and six assists. So he doesn't really give you a lot defensively. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I mean, he's a 25 and 5 guy. Not bad. And I'm just trying to think of a disgruntled star right now. Um, I wouldn't even call him a vet in his prime because he's still really young. He's but I mean, yeah, I feel like that's a guy right now that I think a lot of people have their, you know, their questions about like who could possibly be available cuz I'm just going to look right. I mean, like, there there's not a whole lot like out there. Um, looks like the Spurs are about to lose their 12th straight game. Holy crap. That sucks. <laughs> I mean, nobody's talking about that. Mm-hmm. I mean, I made a post about I made a post about it. People but people like roasted me for it. <laughs> I would, dude, I might even try. I mean, I wouldn't trade a top three pick for Keldon Johnson, but I would look at a Keldon Johnson because I don't know, it seems like Spurs fans are getting kind of upset with him. Dude, I might even go after a big like Zach Collins. You know what I'm saying? From the San Antonio Spurs. Again, not trading a top three pick, but yeah, to trade in, in order to trade a top three pick, I would look at someone like, you know, Zion. I mean, maybe even Carl Anthony Towns, who's been playing a little bit better for Minnesota. I know people don't love his contract, but again, the salary cap is about to go up again in the NBA, I believe. So I don't know. There's a couple of options out there. I would, yeah, I would, I would do it for the right vet. 
Yeah, I mean, I know some people mentioned Brandon Ingram. I know when we had Corey on, that was a guy that uh, we had talked about. Brandon Ingram would be nice. Um, there's just I, – I just look around the NBA landscape, and, like, I know some people have mentioned Carl Anthony Towns, but the Wolves are, I think, what, the first seed, or the number one seed in the West right now. Um, there's just – there's not a whole lot out there. I know someone just mentioned uh, R.J. Barrett. Um I don't think I would trade my number three overall pick for RJ Barrett. Not to say he's not a good player. I just don't really think it would work out. He's having a pretty decent season. I mean, Towns would, I mean, he would ideally fit if you want to do that too big lineup. I think my, my thing with that too big lineup is we've never had the perimeter players to make it work. And I think the reason why the Wolves were having such success is they have Anthony Edwards, who's a superstar. And they have two bigs that can, one, protect the rim, and one one can stretch the floor so it's working. And they have Jaden McDaniels, who's just a freaking Swiss Army knife defensively. Dude, I would seriously go after someone like Kelton Johnson. I really would. Like, he's a good shooter. He can score. I mean, you need some more perimeter help. He gives you that. You're not getting Devil, Devin Vassell or Jeremy So. So can I don't even know how to say his last name. Butcher, make fun of me in the comments for getting the name wrong. <laughs> yeah, I get Victor Wembanyama, but if you can get Kelvin Johnson, why not? You know, it might work. Can you get, can you pull someone from the Houston Rockets? I don't know. Uh, I, I mean, I don't know. It's it's pretty bleak right now. Like when you look, because there's not really like a disgruntled star that just like wants out. You know. Like Hard, Harden was the last one, and I think any Piston fan would not want to trade for James Harden. No, I mean, if we're talking like two guard, Zach Levine, mm-hmm. he seemed to be pretty pissed off at his situation in Chicago, and I've talked about him. I like his game alongside Cade Cunningham. <laughs> thank, thank you. Oh, my bad. That's not the comment I meant to uh, put on. Imagine if we got Wimby, we'd be three and uh, fourteen. Patrick, man, I, that would be. Uh, I think the headlines would be pretty damn funny if that were were the case. Yeah, I don't know what the Spurs are doing though. Dude, what, what did you, what did you think about Greg Popovich telling people not to boo Kawhi Leonard? Dude, if I buy a ticket, I should be able to boo whoever I want. I actually liked it. Oh, um, I knew you would. Look, think like. I don't have a problem with Pistons fans like booing someone that didn't do anything for your franchise, but that guy won you an NBA championship. Yeah. Oh, dude, I'm not agreeing with them. I'm just saying you should have the right to boo if you want. Well, whatever dude, your crazy dude, reason is. Dude, some of the security guards at LCA, man, if you make any type of noise, bro, like they're on your ass. Really? Hmm. Dude, like. I went to a game and this one guy next to me was super drunk and in a in obnoxious and he spilled his beer like two times and I was like, dude, like I can't believe you just spent like thirty bucks and you spilled it both times. But that's beside the point. They literally had like a cop just watch him for like a good twenty minutes and like he moved the wrong way and the cop like damn near sprinted towards him. I was just like Yo, chill. He's not doing anything. He's just he was he was heckling the Cavs players. Yeah, he's probably pretty. It might have had more to do with him being pretty drunk and spilling his beer than anything else. But yeah, I mean, I don't know. Maybe he was saying something pretty bad to the Cavaliers players. I couldn't understand what he was saying because he was so drunk. Uh, Didn't make any sense. (laughs) I was just like, dude, holy crap. Uh. Yeah, a lot of people said that Pop doing that uh, sounds like a wrestling promo. I just, I don't know. <laughs> I thought it was just so weird that he did it. Like, I mean, I don't could know. You, could you imagine if, like, uh, Dwayne Casey did that? Yeah, I yeah, I would, I would <laughs> laugh at him. I would laugh at him. It'd be so weird. Oh, don't boo. I, I can boo whoever I want. Why are we, I don't know. I'm not. I don't want to get into it too much. It, it, it wouldn't be called Malice at LCA. I've told you guys it would be Malice at the Pizza Palace. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> oh man, like that I, I saw Isaiah Stewart's like fight and I said Malice at the Pizza Palace almost happened. <laughs> I saw that. Um <clears throat> I don't we, know. We can, we can wrap this up though, if, if you're good, man. Almost good. Well, almost did two hours. Like it, I'm pretty tired. I don't know about you. I've been working since like twelve o'clock. <laughs> I've done nothing today. Just one worked out. That's about it. But um, Sweet. yeah. Do you want me to tell everybody where we can, where they can find it? Sure. Tell people where they can support it, where they can follow you, and all that other stuff. Well, if you guys want to follow me, follow me on Twitter at Lance Caparossi. That's where you can find me. You can find me on all social media. Well, you can find me on Twitter and threads at Lance Caparossi. Don't hit me up on anything else. Thank you guys for listening to the Pistons Talk podcast. Do us a favor. Go to Google, Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts and subscribe. After you subscribe, leave a review, drop a rating, but more importantly, tell a Pistons fan. Peace, guys. Hopefully beat the Wizards.